dry deserts, hot springs, underwater hydrothermal systems, polar regions, carbonic springs. Places that we thought sterile have turned out to be teeming with life. Biologists know the peculiar inhabitants of these hostile places by the name of extremophiles. Until quite recently, no one knew they were there. Now, by studying them, it may be possible for us to achieve a true understanding of biodiversity, the evolution of living beings, and biogenesis itself. The continual advances in genetics and molecular biology continue to throw up different hypotheses about the way in which life might have emerged. We know that we are made up of atoms, just as the rest of the matter in the universe. We know that the atoms formed molecules, and that from these, the first cells developed. We understand, then, that the existence of life obeys, above all, the laws of physics and science. In fact, according to scientists, life represents a special state of matter. So far, we have managed to describe some aspects of biogenesis, but we have not been able to reconstruct the entire process. The story of the development of life is extremely complex. At the moment, we can only understand a few of the chapters. Bacteria are the direct descendants of Luca. For millions of years, they were the only living beings that inhabited the Earth. Plants and animals are the most recent product of the evolutionary process which stems from them. Without bacteria, we would never have existed. In less than a billion years, these beings evolved into a new species capable of feeding off the sun's energy and of generating oxygen. These cyanobacteria, or blue-green bacteria, were essential to the history of life because they set off the process of photosynthesis. The air we breathe today is the result of hundreds of millions of years of bacterial metabolism. Bacteria and their ability to transform solar energy were the cause of the first great disaster in the history of the Earth, contamination by oxygen, a lethal gas that gave life to the planet. These first photosynthetic beings, known as cyanobacteria, took 1.5 billion years to contaminate the Earth's atmosphere. The continual exhalation of billions and billions of these minute creatures gradually increased the concentrations of oxygen in the atmosphere from 0.1% in the initial stages to levels which constitute 20% of the volume of Earth's atmosphere today. Many of these pioneers of life perished from oxygen poisoning. Meanwhile, the planet was preparing itself for us. In the early history of the planet, there was very little free oxygen in the atmosphere. So most of the organisms, bacteria particularly, were adapted to metabolize, to grow and reproduce in the absence of oxygen. Now, at some point, certainly more than 2,500 million years ago, and possibly as much as 3,500 million years ago, the first photosynthetic bacteria, blue-green bacteria and other organisms, released oxygen into the atmosphere. Initially, of course, this would have been poison to all those creatures that were used to living in the absence of oxygen. So if you want to put it like that, yes, originally oxygen was a pollutant. But of course, it became, as it gradually built up in concentration, absolutely vital, literally vital, to the evolution of animals. 
because animals use oxygen to breathe. So a pollutant, in one sense, became the necessity for life further advancement. And of course, the process continues now with uh, plants on land, forests and so on, photosynthesizing and producing um, the atmosphere that enables us to continue living. Since Luca started off life on Earth, the processes of natural evolution have generated billions of animal and plant species. The Earth has witnessed four billion years of successive adaptations brought about by the genetic transmission involved in the process of reproduction. The first evidence of descendants of Luca was found in the warm region of Pilbara in Western Australia, one of the oldest geological areas of the planet. These fossil remains, formed by successive layers of bacterial sediment, date back 3.5 billion years. During a long period of time, they were the most abundant living organisms in our world, dominating all kinds of environments, from the gentlest to the most hostile, living in the glaciers of the Antarctic and also in volcanic springs. After the great contamination by oxygen, some bacteria evolved into rather more complex life forms. This is when the eukaryotic cells emerged. Unlike their predecessors, the prokaryotic cells, which have no defined nucleus, the eukaryotic cells not only possess a nucleus to harbor the DNA, but also have complex structures which are able to carry out highly specialized functions, such as mitochondriae to breathe, Golgi apparatus for excretion and ribosomes for the synthesis of proteins. All the superior forms of life are equipped with eukaryotic cells of this kind, containing a nucleus. These organisms may have originated in the first steps of symbiosis between living beings, whereby two or more individuals of different species combine to obtain mutual benefits. It's possible that some bacteria without nuclei lived inside other larger bacteria, providing their excess energy in exchange for protection. In this way, the guest cells became specialized organs for their hosts. This process generated more complex organisms. American biologist Lynn Margulis, a specialist researcher in the origins of life, believes that this convenient arrangement between bacteria was not an isolated event. According to her hypothesis, the transition towards eukaryotic organisms was characterized by multiple symbiotic processes. Proof of this is that cooperative association between individuals of different species still occurs. Small birds clean the skin of the rhinoceros. Bees take nectar from the flowers and contribute to the process of pollination. We ourselves make use of bacteria to aid our digestive functions. As Margulis wrote, we live in a symbiotic planet, and precisely for this reason, what happens to some will at some stage inevitably affect others.